In this video, we're going to look at the boundary layer equations. First, we're going to derive those boundary layer equations, and then we're going to look at a flat plate boundary layer flow. We'll look at inclined and declined boundary layer flows, and we'll put the two together, an incline and a decline, to make a boundary layer over a bump. And finally, we'll think a little bit about the limitations of the boundary layer equations. So we're working within our analytic solutions here, and in particular, we're looking at differential equations. When we, look at it, when we form the governing equations of fluid mechanics, we get the Navier-Stokes equations, and what the boundary layer equations are a simplification of the Navier-Stokes equations. And this is where we're working in this video. So starting with a two-dimensional Navier-Stokes equations with quite a few assumptions already, we're assuming that the flow is incompressible, and that's why our density was pulled out of, uh, out of these terms. We're also assuming that the, the other properties are constant, like the thermal conductivity and the uh, viscosity, because we've pulled them out of derivative operators as well. We're also assuming it's a Newtonian fluid because we've used a linear stress-strain relationship to come up with these viscous force terms. And we've neglected viscous dissipation and uh, any conversion of any other forms of energy into thermal energy uh, within our systems. So these are the Navier-Stokes equations. Now, when we look at a boundary layer flow, we have to realize that the boundary layer is very thin compared to the objects. Of course, when we draw it, we exaggerate this, but these delta values are really small compared to the object in the flow. And you'll see that if you look at the flow physics video or if you look in at pictures in the book that I recommended, an album of fluid motion. And so if that's the case, that these boundary layers are very small compared to the objects, then we can say that these changes, that u velocity is much, much bigger than a v velocity. So we're going to have a very small v velocity here because obviously if we take uh, this region here, there's less flow where we have the velocity profiles going down to zero than when we had a constant velocity at u infinity over the same dimension. And so a very small amount of flow has to come out of the boundary there in order to conserve mass. But the u velocities are going to be much, much bigger than that v velocity. And Equally importantly, the changes in the y direction are going to be much, much bigger than the changes in the x direction. This layer is very thin. We're going from 0 to u infinity over a very thin layer. And so our changes normal to the plate are much more significant than our changes in the flow direction. And this enables us to actually greatly simplify the flow, the flow equations. Starting with conservation of mass, there's no simplification. We have the u, which is large, and changes in x, which are small. We have the v, which is small, but the changes in y, which are very large. And so we need to keep both of those terms and conservation of mass is unchanged. When I look at the y-momentum equation, however, it's a very different situation. Here we have the changes in the v-velocity with respect to x. The v-velocity is small and changes in the x-direction are small. Here we have the changes of a, the ch rate of change of an already small variable. Here we have the rate of change of an already small variable multiplied by the small variable. And so this term is going to go to zero. And here we have the changes, here we have the changes in the changes of a small variable with respect to the small change direction. And so this term is zero. And similarly here, we have the changes in the changes of a small variable which is expected to be even smaller. If v is small, the, the rate that it changes is going to be small, and the rate that it, the rate of change of the rate of change is going to be even smaller. And so we can eliminate this term. And that means we're left with the very important result that dp dy is zero. There is no pressure gradient normal to my plate, normal to my surface, in a boundary there flow. And we'll use that to grade it further in the video. Conservation of x momentum. There's only one term that cancels out here, if you think about it, and that is, of course, that the change in u with respect to x, the small change direction, the change and the change, are going to be zero. In every other case, we have a significant term. We have a change of the large variable in the, in the, in the direction where it's changing, the change of the large variable with respect to the direction where it changes at y, normal to the plate, where the changes are much larger. And here we have the large variable multiplying this, and so all of these terms will have to be kept. We eliminate that first term, so maybe it doesn't look uh, more sim it doesn't look so much simpler, but in actual fact, it's much easier to solve. In addition, because we knew that dp dy is equal to zero from the y momentum equation, we can turn our dp dx into a ordinary derivative, and in many cases, it's actually just a constant. Normally, we'll divide through by our density, and we'll write our equation in this way where we get the kinematic viscosity kinematic viscosity on the viscous term, and we divide the pressure gradient by the rho, and we're left with just the acceleration on this side. 
If we repeat the same process for the conservation of energy equation, it's very similar to the X momentum equation. The changes in temperature with respect to X are the only term that simplify here. And so we get this equation here. And again, it's quite common to divide through by uh, the volumetric heat capacity here in order to introduce the thermal diffusivity into our equation here. So the complete set of our equations is listed here with all of our assumptions, including the boundary layer assumptions. And again, we have the situation where we have four unknown variables, u, v, p, and t, and we have four equations. So we can, in principle, solve this set of equations. It is a much simpler set of equations to solve. And I should also point out that we can solve the first three equations on their own, if we know the, the average temperature of the flow that we're talking about, or the range of temperatures, we can calculate all of our properties using the film temperature, the average of the surface temperature and the free stream temperature. And then we can solve for U, V, and P using just these equations to solve for the flow field. Once we have the flow field, we can then simply use that flow field in the U and V here in order to solve the energy equation. And in so doing, we can greatly simplify things because perhaps we could solve the energy equation for different boundary conditions uh, without having to resolve these equations. We're just using the U and V. There are, of course, some situations where we need to couple these, and there's ways where we simplify the coupling, in particular when we want to look at natural convection later in the course. Okay, I want to non-dimensionalize the boundary layer equations just to see the form of them. And we're going to non-dimensionalize them as we did before. The u component, or the velocities, are going to be non-dimensionalized by u infinity. Position variables are going to be non-dimensionalized by a length scale l, which in our flat plate is the length of the plate. And our pressure by rho u infinity squared, and our now familiar non-dimensional temperature. So when I non-dimensionalize the conservation of mass equation, it stays exactly the same. Of course, I get a U infinity coming out from non-dimensionalizing U, and I get an L from non-dimensionalizing X, similarly from V and W, but I can divide those out by this zero, so the equation is unchanged. When I look at conservation of momentum, I get a U squared coming out from these two terms, and I get an L coming out from these two terms. And so when I divide that U squared over here, you see I get my non-dimensional uh, pressure term there. Also, when I describe divide uh, the u infinity here, as well as uh, the length that comes out from here, I get another u infinity from here to cancel one of them. I get two length scales here uh, in order to essentially give us the Reynolds number here. We get a u infinity times l. Actually, we get a nu over u infinity times l, which is one over the Reynolds number. And so here's our non-dimensional uh, x momentum equation, and of course. Uh, this is exactly like conservation of mass. I get some terms coming out from these non-dimensionalizations, but I can get rid of them because I have the zero on this side. And finally, non-dimensionalizing the conservation of energy equation, of course, it's of exactly the same form as the x-momentum equation, with the, except for the fact that we don't have this dpdx term here, and we have alpha instead of nu that appeared here. And so, if you recall our Prandtl number, the ratio of the kinematic viscosity to the thermal diffusivity, we'll see the Reynolds number corrected by the Prandtl number to give us this term here. And so our non-dimensional energy equation looks like this. And again, notice that these two equations are of very, very similar forms. And if there's no pressure gradient and the Prandtl number is 1, they're of identical forms. So we expect strong similarities between the flow solution, the velocity solution and the temperature solution and in some cases one is simply a scaling of the other and we can determine it and that's what our Reynolds analogy was about. Okay so now I want to think about our a couple of cases we're going to think about a boundary layer on a flat plate. Now if we have a flat plate we can draw streamlines far away from the flow of course the streamlines are going to be perfectly straight despite my drawing of them and they're going to be equally spaced because the velocity is everywhere out here u infinity. So perfectly straight uh, streamlines equally spaced and we know from our solution of the equations that dp dy is zero in the boundary layer. So we have a boundary layer down here but dp dy is zero. Now if we think about these streamlines when there is no streamline curvature which there isn't despite my drawing it means there's no pressure gradient in this direction and we also know of course that the pressure far away is p atmospheric everywhere. Now, since there's no pressure gradient, because there's no curvature on these streamlines, and we've already shown that there's no pressure gradient in the boundary layer, that means that the pressure everywhere on these lines is p-atmospheric. So we have p-atmospheric here, p-atmospheric here, p 
atmospheric everywhere. And therefore, we can see immediately that the pressure gradient in this flow is zero. I'd also like to point out something that we can get from just thinking about this solution right away. The energy equation and the y-momentum equation are very, very similar here. In fact, if the Prandtl number is one, they are identical. Now, if I think about plotting either the skin friction coefficient or the convection coefficient, they're going to have the same form because these are the same forms of equations. And of course, remember that the convection coefficient or the Neusselt number, if I non-dimensionalized it, is related to this temperature gradient at the surface. The skin friction coefficient is related to this temperature gradient at the surface here. Well, now clearly, the gradient is much, much larger here because we're going from zero to u infinity over this thin delta here. As we go further down, delta is larger, and we have the same velocity difference over a larger distance. Same thing for temperature, ts to t infinity over a smaller distance, ts to t infinity over a larger distance. And so what we're going to expect in either of these cases, whether it's cf or whether it's the, the convection coefficient of the Neusselt number, they're going to follow exactly the same form. They're going to be high at the leading edge of the plate, and they're going to decrease as the boundary layer grows down that plate. Now let's think of the case of an inclined plate. We start again by drawing our streamlines. Far away, we're going to have a straight streamline, and of course, everywhere out here, it's p-atmospheric pressure. So as we move closer to the plate, with our equally spaced contour lines, we can see that the flow has to accelerate. The spacing here is larger, I've drawn a bad contour line, but either way, the flow spacing here is larger than the flow spacing here, which means that in order to conserve mass, the fluid is accelerating. Now, far away where the flow is inviscid, where we're more outside of the boundary there, we can apply Bernoulli's equation. And if we apply Bernoulli's equation through here, where the flow is accelerating, we know, of course, that the, while the flow accelerates, the pressure is decreasing. And therefore, I have a pressure decrease as I move along this streamline. Now, we know that dp dy is zero in our boundary layer, and therefore, the pressure here going into our boundary layer is the same. Okay. Pressure at the surface is the same as the pressure outside of the boundary layer, and we know that the pressure, I call this p1, and this is p2, the flow has Ooh, the flow has accelerated, and therefore the pressure has decreased, and therefore we see that the pressure 1 is greater than pressure 2. So, for this inclined plate, we can reason that dp dx is less than 0. Now that's an interesting result, because we know that we have an inertia force moving in this direction, and now we know, because the pressure is decreasing, that we have a pressure force acting in this direction. Now, the boundary there arose because we have a zero velocity here, and as soon as we get a little bit away from the plate, the momentum carries the fluid downstream. So we have the boundary there forming because of that inertia force that's carrying the flow down against this plate in combination with the no-slip condition or the, the TS, the, the temperature being constant on the surface. Now, when we incline the plate, in addition to that inertia force, we also have a pressure force. And so we would expect that this boundary there is going to be even thinner. The, the fluid is driven both by the inertia and the pressure uh, in the positive x direction, and so we'd expect a thinner boundary there. And if we expect a thinner boundary there, then we expect a higher skin friction coefficient, and we expect a higher Neusselt number or a higher convection coefficient. So we're going to expect, with a negative pressure gradient, the pressure is decreasing in the flow direction, we have a smaller boundary there, a higher skin friction coefficient, and a higher heat transfer coefficient compared to the flat plate. The opposite occurs if we have a declined plate. Again, we can go through the same process, drawing our streamlines, and we can clearly see that we have a flow deceleration here. Again, away from the flow in the inviscid core, we can apply Bernoulli's equation and see that the, if the velocity is decreasing, the pressure is increasing. Again, I have no pressure gradient inside the boundary there, and therefore, if I draw my, my points down, from my inviscid core and draw a P1 and a P2, I can clearly see that P1 has to be less than P2, or my pressure gradient is positive in my decline plate. 
Now that means that we had our inertia force going in this direction, as we in every case, but now our pressure force is acting in this direction. And so we expect this boundary there to be larger because the pressure force is resisting the inertia force. And in fact, that pressure force can overcome the inertia force and we can experience a flow separation. So perhaps our boundary there is growing smaller or larger than if we had uh, no, than, than if it was a flat plate. And perhaps at some point we experience a flow separation where the flow no longer follows the surface. And in this region here, we have a flow separation. Let's look at the combination of the boundary layers with, uh, of the incline and the decline. Again, the same arguments here. We see clearly that we have a flow acceleration here and a pressure which is decreasing until we reach this point at which we have a flow deceleration and the pressure is increasing. So in this region here, in all cases we have inertia in this direction. In this case, up to the top of our bump, we have a pressure force in this direction, and past the top of our bump, we have a pressure force in this direction. So again, putting it together, we expect a smaller boundary there here, greater skin coefficient, greater heat transfer, a larger boundary there here, smaller heat transfer coefficient, smaller skin friction, and the possibility of a flow separation on this side. There's, of course, no possibility of flow separation on this side where the inertia and pressure are in the same direction. So we can see from this clearly that the geometry of the flow is what's determining these pressure gradients. And if we made this into an airfoil instead, we would see that this, this pressure gradient is going to vary over the shape as it changes. Or if we made it into a cylinder, uh, we may, we'll see variation as that area between the streamline and the surface is changing but it's clearly the shape of the body which is resulting in the pressure gradient. When the pressure gradient is negative, we have smaller boundary layers and no chances of separation, and in those regions where we have a positive pressure gradient, we have the possibility of flow separation and larger boundary layers, smaller heat transfer, smaller skin friction. I want to think about the boundary layer, the limitations of the boundary layer equation, and of course we made the assumption that changes in x and changes in y changes in y are much greater than changes in x, and that the u velocity is much greater than the v velocity. If we think of a situation where we had our boundary there developing here, and it's smaller than the case if it was a flat plate, and then we get over the top of this, and the boundary there starts growing faster because of that pressure gradient, and let's say at some point we have a separation, as I drew before. And that means that we have this recirculation zone in here, the separated flow uh, region, where this is neither of these assumptions are going to be valid. The separated flow region, the changes in x and the changes in y are roughly of the same length scale, and the u and v velocity are roughly the same. And so our boundary layer equations do not apply in these flow separated zones. We may be able to determine from the boundary layer equations where this is going to occur, but we need the full Navier-Stokes equations to understand what's happening in here. Similarly, in all cases, whether the whether the boundary layer, whether the plate is inclined, curved, or not, uh, at the leading edge, the boundary layer equations are not going to apply. Simply, we have a full u infinity uh, velocity here, which instantaneously goes to zero at the at the leading edge of our plate, and therefore, the changes in u and v, the changes in the x direction and the changes in the y direction are going to be of the same order of magnitude right near the leading edge. Fortunately, that's a very localized effect. And our boundary layer equations are valid uh, quite quickly beyond that point. But you may see some trouble when you're looking exactly at the leading edge uh, for that reason. It is a singularity in the flow. And in reality, the flow would adjust to this point upstream. But we haven't really allowed it to do that in the boundary layer equations uh, because we took out that term that has a variation in the x direction because of our assumption, which is not valid at that point. And you'll notice that I've drawn all of my plates to have a sharp point at the beginning. And that's because... If I had a blunt body in the flow, if my start of my plate actually looked like this, then the flow is not going to be able to turn this corner. And the flow is going to result in a flow separation over that, uh, over that corner. We'll have a stagnation point there. And our first streamline will result in a flow separation, and our boundary there will begin developing from here. And so we'll have a larger region at the beginning where we cannot use the boundary there is because of that flow separation, we'd have to resort to the full Navier-Stokes equations. Of course, if I have a nice sharp leading edge, I don't have that problem, and that's why we draw our plates that way.